Good evening and welcome to the 2019 Arrow Lecture Series on Ethics and Leadership. My name is Rob Reich. I'm a professor in the Political Science Department and I'm the faculty director of the Center for Ethics in Society, which is the sponsor of the Arrow Lecture Series and this evening's event. Tonight's presentation by Professor Jennifer Doudna is also co-sponsored by the Center for Biomedical Ethics at the Stanford Medical School and the Center for Law and Biosciences at the Law School. I want to begin just by saying a few words about the lecture series. The Arrow Lectures were created in 2005, and they have become amongst the most prestigious lectures at Stanford University. Previous Arrow lecturers include a roster of exceptionally distinguished social scientists and philosophers, including Esther Duflo, Paul Collier, my namesake Robert Reich, Thomas Piketty, and Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen. Speaking of Nobel Prize winners, the Arrow lectures are named in honor of our colleague and Stanford Emeritus Professor Kenneth Arrow. Arrow was one of the most renowned scholars ever to have taught at Stanford. He was one of the most influential economists of the 20th century, and he died just a little less than two years ago, leaving behind an incredible legacy of research and teaching. Ken was the youngest recipient ever of the Nobel Prize in Economics. He was 51 years old when he won it. And perhaps more remarkable than that lofty achievement is this. No fewer than five of Ken Arrow's students have gone on to win the Nobel Prize in Economics. We honor him tonight with the lecture from Dr. Jennifer Doudna, whom many consider to be a shoe-in herself for a future, future Nobel Prize albeit not in economics. <laughs> Our topic tonight with Jennifer Doudna is the promise and peril of genetic editing. And yes, for any of the name freaks in the audience, Professor Doudna is aware that her last name spells out, do you DNA? <laughs> the CRISPR technique for editing the human genome that Professor Doudna has identified is revolutionary. It permits in principle nothing less than the ability of human beings to take control of evolution. The Israeli historian Yuval Harari in his most recent book has said that the twin revolutions in information technology and biotechnology will determine the fate of the human species in the 21st century. And that unless these revolutions are harnessed to the interests of human beings and supporting the agency of humans, it may cause the complete rewriting and reformulation of what it means to be human. He was thinking, Yuval Harari was, of CRISPR and the possibility that genetic editing will be used not just for therapeutic purposes, but to selectively enhance future generations of human beings. And of course, our discussion tonight couldn't be more timely if you've been following the news, you know that late last year, a Chinese scientist, Dr. He, announced the birth of the first CRISPR-edited human baby. We'll be discussing this tonight with Jennifer Doudna. The format for the evening. Dr. Doudna will offer a presentation, followed by a 30-minute conversation with me, a philosopher, and Professor Kelly Ormond, a, prof a geneticist here at the Stanford School of Medicine, followed by questions from the audience. Professor Doudna and Professor Ormond will be introduced by an amazing Stanford undergraduate named Ji Wu Li. Hold on to your seats as I tell you a bit about Ji Wu. She's a sophomore here at Stanford, majoring in computational biology. She's been working on CRISPR since her high school days at the Academy for Medical Science Technology in Hackensack, New Jersey. And as a high school junior, she set to work on a novel approach to cell-specific cancer therapeutics with CRISPR genome editing in human cell lines. Her resume lists dozens of prizes in local, state, national, and international science competitions, including first place in the biggest competition of all, the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. She's continued this research here at Stanford University, working in Stanford labs, as well as at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. Her work caught the attention more than a year ago of Jennifer Doudna. And Doudna then nominated Ji Wu Lee for the Wired Magazine 25 Prize, where the, most, the 25 most important leaders of today select the 25 people who will shape the next 25 years. 
Ji Wu has also presented at the White House, and in whatever little free time she has, she's also a sorority member on a dance team and a health educator at the Cardinal Free Clinics. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this name, and please welcome Stanford sophomore Ji Wu Lee. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Professor Reich. Uh, so I'm particularly honored to have been asked to introduce Professor Doudna tonight because of how important her work has been for my own research. So my journey with CRISPR began in 2014 when I was a sophomore in high school. And I was a 14-year-old biology enthusiast who had noticed the recent explosion of CRISPR publications and who was also fortunate enough to go to a high school that had its very own research program and in-house laboratories. And excited by the promise of this new genome editing technology, I quickly joined the cell biology lab. And with the help of my research mentor, I began to develop a new approach to cancer therapeutics. So because current cancer treatments have a lot of side effects, I wanted to create a CRISPR system that would kill cancer cells without harming normal cells in the hopes that this would eliminate these side effects. And when I began this research in 2014, the CRISPR revolution was still in its infancy. So much of my early research involved combing through scientific literature. And during several of these searches, I came across publications by Professor Doudna. And Professor Doudna is one of the leading figures in the discovery that CRISPR, which was originally discovered in bacteria, could be harnessed for genome editing. And many of her publications were crucial in helping me develop my own project. Uh, as I continued to work with CRISPR for the next three years, running experiments and sharing my science with others, my excitement for CRISPR only grew. After I graduated high school in 2017, I was excited to continue CRISPR research in college and have since joined an amazing CRISPR lab at Stanford. By a stroke of fortune, within a few weeks of starting my freshman year at Stanford, I had heard that Dr. Jennifer Doudna was coming to speak at Stanford about her current work with CRISPR. And I was able to attend her talk and finally see the person whose work I had poured over during all those years. And I was inspired to hear her speak of her role in discovering today's hottest genome editing technology, as well as her vision for its future. Just this past summer, I received an email saying that Professor Dana had noticed my work with CRISPR and had nominated me for Wire 25. And I was able to meet with her just this past summer and um, talk with her one-on-one -on -one about the future applications of CRISPR, as well as what kind of ethical implications they will bear. And she shared some of her um, concerns about the unethical uses of CRISPR. And as a member of the generation in which human genome editing will become extremely relevant, I share many of her concerns. And uh, with the recent reports of the first ever CRISPR, ba CRISPR edited babies, um, the topics that we discussed over the summer have become all the more relevant. And we are very lucky to have her speak with us today. Uh, professor Dauda is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. She's also the Lee Cushing Chancellor's Professor in uh, Biomedical and Health Sciences. And she has been an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 1997, as well as a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institute since 2018. She's also the executive director of the new Innovative Genomics Institute. And Professor Downa has received many prestigious honors, including the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, as well as membership in the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy for Arts and Sciences. I also want to introduce Professor Kelly Ormond, uh, who we will hear from later tonight with Professor Reich. So Professor Ormond is a uh, professor in the Department of Genetics at Stanford, as well as a faculty member in the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. She received her bachelor's degree in biology and psychology from Bucknell University, as well as her uh, master's degree in genetic counseling from Northwestern University. She also has a um, postdoctoral fellowship certificate in clinical medical ethics at the McLean Center um, at the University of Chicago, and has also been certified by the American Board of Genetic Counseling. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Jennifer Doudna. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be back at Stanford. Um, I would like to start by thanking Rob Reich and, of course, Ji Wu for that fabulous introduction and for the invitation to come and, and speak with you and to share a, a very interesting evening. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I thought that I would uh, start by talking about 
the science of genome editing a little bit. Don't worry, we won't get too far in the weeds. But I want to explain a bit about this technology from my perspective as a biochemist and someone who knew almost nothing about genome editing just a few short years ago. And, um, and that's because what I, the story that I want to tell you tonight is really about a technology that came about from a curiosity-driven scientific project that started with a very different kind of question than where it ended up. And to me, you know, I've been, I've been doing science now for several decades, and what I've always enjoyed about science is that you don't know where it's going. You ask questions and you try to answer them in the laboratory, working with, you know, if you're lucky, smart students and people smarter than you, and, it, and the science uh, goes where it will. And, you, and your, your job as a scientist is really just to follow the clues, try to interpret the data, and make sense of, of, of what it means about the natural world. And that's what we were doing in the lab back in 2012 when we came across an enzyme that's part of a bacterial adaptive immune system known as CRISPR, that once its mechanism of behavior was uncovered, immediately presented itself as a powerful technology for something very different from what it does in its native host in bacteria, and that is as a technology for genome editing. So let me just start by, by uh, pointing out that I think very, very typically technologies have come about in the way I'm going to describe tonight, where scientists are interested in a question, they're trying to figure something out, and they, they kind of stumble across something that has already happened in nature that gives a powerful clue to the way that you might be able to do something that you'd like to be able to do or control in the laboratory. And that's absolutely true for uh, CRISPR-based genome editing. And what, this, what you're seeing here is just a slide that shows the, the surface of a bacterial cell under attack from viruses. And the, when these viruses attack the cell, they're literally injecting their genetic material, their DNA, into the cell. And for a bacterium, that event initiates a process where the cell has about 20 minutes to defend itself against the virus before it gets destroyed. And so that's a very powerful selection for ways that the bacterium can fight off these viruses, and that's exactly what the CRISPR system is. It's an adaptive immune system that allows cells to detect an infection, grab a little piece of the viral DNA, and store it in a place in the bacterial DNA, in the bacterial genome called CRISPR, and then use that information to protect cells from future infection. So uh, just to tell you a bit about how I got into this, I was uh, minding my own business, you know, working on, on other problems and, and looking at how cells control the flow of genetic information, but I was working mostly on mammalian cells at the time, back in around 2005, when a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Jill Banfield, called me one day and told me that she had discovered something potentially very interesting in her, in her research. Now, she's a scientist who, very different from me, she works on bacteria and she studies them not in the laboratory but in their natural setting. So she goes foraging for interesting microbes that are growing in the wild in various, various environments. And rather than trying to cultivate those bugs in the laboratory, she sequences their DNA to find out who they are and, importantly, what kinds of viruses they might be interacting with. And that work had uncovered something that at the time was a real head scratcher. And that was that about half of the bacteria that Banfield's lab was studying had a very distinctive set of DNA sequences in the bacterial chromosome, which is the, uh, what you're seeing here in the cartoon, that included short snippets of repeated DNA, the black diamonds, flanking unique bits of DNA sequence. And what emerged in those three publications in 2005 was that those unique bits of sequence in these arrays were in fact derived from viruses. So this was the first hint that perhaps what these mysterious sequences were were some kind of adaptive immune system, a way that cells could store information from viruses and somehow, by an unknown mechanism, use that information to protect cells from future infection. 
So I thought that was, you know, very interesting. And so we met, we started meeting kind of regularly for coffee. And I started a little side project in my research laboratory to try to figure out how these adaptive immune systems might actually function. And uh, what emerged over the next few years from work that actually was done largely in uh, two different settings, one was in a couple of, bi uh, of, of bioinformatics labs, people that work on DNA sequences and try to make sense of what they mean by comparing different kinds of sequences, as well as scientists working in a, a yogurt company who were trying to figure out how to protect their cultures that they were using for uh, culturing yogurt and cheese from being destroyed by viruses. And that combination of scientists figured out that these CRISPR immune systems protect cells because they can detect a viral infection, which is cartooned here, and store pieces of viral DNA in the CRISPR array, in the chromosome. Importantly, there are adjacent genes called CRISPR-associated, or CAS genes, that encode proteins that work together with these CRISPR arrays. And the way the process unfolds in the cell is that the CRISPR array at the DNA level is copied into molecules of RNA. And so for many of you know what RNA is, but if you don't, it's basically just a chemical cousin of DNA that is a kind of a throwaway copy of parts of the genome. So the cell makes a little RNA copy of the CRISPR array. And then those individual RNA molecules each include a single segment of sequence that can match the sequence of the DNA and is derived from a virus. So you can think about it like a little address code that's been produced by the cell that provides an address to a particular virus. And those RNA molecules then combine with proteins encoded by the Cas genes. They form protein RNA surveillance complexes that can search the cell looking for matching bits of sequence that might match those sequences in these little RNA address labels. And if a match is found, then the cell, these uh, molecules are able to grab onto the matching DNA sequence and allow the Cas proteins to cut up the DNA. So for bacteria, it's a great way to create a genetic vaccination card in the cell that can provide protection from future infection. So it's some really cool biology. Now, um, one of the things about these systems, these CRISPR uh, systems, is that they're, they're very, um, they're very uh, diverse in biology. So scientists started looking at all of the different kinds of genes that occur in different bacteria that have CRISPR adaptive immune systems. And what they found was that in this cartoon just shows each, each of those boxes, each colored box corresponds to a different kind of gene that's found in different bacteria with CRISPR immunity. And you can see there's lots of different variability. The, some of the boxes are very small. They encode small proteins. Some of the boxes are big. They encode really big proteins. And so for people like me that work on understanding molecular function, we were having a lot of fun starting to get in there and figure out what the functions of these different proteins and their corresponding RNA address labels were doing. And, uh, and I, that sort of uh, uh, study started uh, leading me to meetings, scientific meetings that I, you know, types of meetings that I had never attended before, including in 2011, a scientific conference on, uh, sponsored by the American Society of Microbiologists. I'm not a microbiologist, but I went to this meeting because they were having a session on CRISPR immunity, which at the time was just, you know, there were really just a handful of labs around the world that had started to pay attention to these things. So at that meeting, I met Emmanuel Charpentier, someone that uh, worked in Sweden. She was uh, working on bacteria that infect humans and trying to understand their biology. And in the course of her research, she had come across CRISPR systems because she found that one of the bugs she studied had a, a very interesting and at the time a very distinctive kind of CRISPR immune system that had just a single large protein known as Cas9 that had been shown genetically to be essential for the function of this CRISPR immune system in this particular kind of bacterium. We met at the conference, we started chatting about our work, and we realized that we had complementary expertise. I work on molecules and how they, how they function. She works on bacteria and their biology and how they infect humans. And we decided to get together to figure out the function of this adaptive immune system 
in uh, the bacterium she was studying. In particular, we wanted to understand the molecular function of this protein, Cas9, which seemed very interesting because it seemed to be the only requirement for these bugs to protect themselves from viruses using uh, their CRISPR system. And that was the question. How does, how does Cas9 work? What does it do? That's what we set out to figure out. And that started us on a great collaboration that is, I think, very um, characteristic of the way that science, at least in my experience, is now conducted, where it's often collaborative, it's often international, it often involves professors in academic organizations, at least, who are working together, but really the work is being conducted by the members of their laboratories, and that was true for us. And so we started working together with uh, two fantastic scientists, Martin uh, Yinek, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, uh, and um, Chris Chylinski, a graduate student in Emmanuel's lab. And these two scientists were working several thousand miles apart, but using the internet and social media and you know, Skype and everything, they were able to um, get to know each other, uh, virtually at least, and share data and ideas. And they figured out that Cas9 is a very interesting protein that has the ability to recognize molecules of DNA at a 20-letter sequence that matches the letters in the guide RNA, that RNA address code. And that's the molecule, and you can see the end of the molecule is gold in this cartoon. That's the address label that the protein uses to recognize a particular place in a DNA molecule, whether the DNA molecule is small or as big as the human genome. Okay? And the way the protein works is it has two active centers that can cut DNA. So remember that DNA is a double helix, and so we have to cut both strands if we're going to actually break it like a, like a rope. And that's what the protein does. And importantly, our studies showed that the system to function requires a second kind of RNA molecule, the molecule shown in red, that provides the handle for Cas9 to bind. So it's really a dual RNA-guided system in nature that allows recognition of viral DNA in bacteria and then cutting of that viral DNA, which leads to its degradation. So really fun, really cool uh, biology. But Martin Yinek in my lab, you know, being sort of a really good biochemist, started trying to minimize the essential parts of this complex of proteins and RNAs, and he was trimming away at the RNA to figure out the minimal parts that would be necessary for this kind of DNA recognition and cutting to work. And he was able to show that you could combine the address label uh, RNA molecule with the handle RNA molecule into a single uh, RNA that we called the single guide RNA that would provide the address and the means of recruiting the Cas9 protein in the same piece of RNA. And the significance of that was that we then had, at this point, had created in the lab a simplified system of providing a sequence of letters to this particular protein that would direct it to any desired place in a DNA molecule and uh, direct Cas9 protein to make a cut in the DNA. And so that was, you know, kind of a, you might think, well, that sounds like kind of a cool widget. But the reason that it was really exciting to us at the time was because this was happening in the context of a lot of other research in the field showing that in animal and plant cells, unlike in bacteria, when DNA is broken like this, the cells can detect broken DNA and repair it. And in the process of repairing it, they can introduce a change to the DNA sequence. And in fact, depending on how this kind of experiment is done, one can control the way that the repair of the DNA happens so that you actually can literally edit a DNA sequence. You can make a precise alteration to the DNA. And so if you imagine being able to do that in a cell, you can actually precisely go into a cell with this kind of a tool, cut the DNA in a particular place, and trigger cells to change the sequence as they fix the, the break in the DNA. And so um, that uh, sort of realization for us was really kind of the moment, I guess, when this, when this curiosity-driven project morph metamorphosed into a very different kind of project. Because we, we realized, looking at each other in the lab, that we had sort of come across this very interesting molecule that nature had evolved. We had been able to engineer it into a simplified form that could be used as a technology. And by using this, 
that we could trigger genome editing in cell types varying from, you know, anything from yeast to human cells to fish to plants to, you know, essentially anything because of the fundamental nature of this, this tool, the way it works. So I thought I would, um, let's see, I think I have a slide here. Yeah, I wanted to show you a video that illustrates how we imagine this molecule of Cas9 with its guide RNA operates when it gets into the nucleus of a cell like ours. So it goes in where the DNA in our nuclei and cells like ours highly uh, compacted into chromatin, and this bacterial enzyme is able to search through the DNA looking for that sequence of 20 letters matching its RNA zip code. And when it finds a match, it is able to hold on to the DNA double helix. It unwinds the DNA and allows a match to be made with the RNA. And then the protein cuts the DNA and hands off those broken ends to repair enzymes in the cell that can fix the break by, for example, here, inserting a new piece of genetic information in the process. So it's a powerful way that scientists can precisely change DNA sequences. And importantly, this can be done in a way trivially because it's quite, quite straightforward to use this protein and to design guide RNAs that will direct this protein to a desired place in essentially any genome, something that very quickly became clear after we published our work in the summer of 2012 by labs that started to adopt this for applications in a wide range of biological settings. So, um, you know, we've continued in my lab. Again, we're, you know, we're uh, biochemists and structural biologists mostly in my lab, so we're very intrigued to understand how this actually works, and we've been working away on understanding how this amazing protein pries apart the DNA double helix to make a break. This is a photograph of a 3D printed model of Cas9 that's based on a crystallographic structure where we can actually see the positions of all the atoms in the protein and the guide RNA and the DNA that it's holding onto. And you get, I'm showing you this here so you get a sort of a sense of the incredible ability of this protein to, to grasp the DNA duplex and hold on to a particular place where it can trigger a break. So it's a highly, uh, it's an, an enzyme that we now understand to be adapted to be quite accurate at DNA recognition and cutting. So you can predict how it's going to work when it gets into cells. And we know a lot more about that now because of all of the thousands of, of experiments that have been done uh, since 2012. And uh, it's an enzyme that uh, has a curious ability to unwind DNA, sort of much like a masseuse, sort of, you know, relaxing the DNA duplex. And as scientists, we're curious about this process. We're still trying to answer this question of how it pries apart the strands of the DNA, something that's fundamental to its mechanism because it doesn't have an external energy source. So it doesn't, a lot of enzymes that are well known, like uh, you know, enzymes that copy DNA and things are uh, proteins that have a way of harnessing some kind of chemical uh, energy source in cells, and this one doesn't do that. So one of the clues that's emerged over the last few years about how it might work is the fact that it undergoes a large change in structure when it binds to RNA and to DNA. And this is a little video that just morphs between different crystallographic structures of the protein. And you can see that it undergoes a big rearrangement in its shape when it holds on to the guide RNA. It forms this uh, structure that has a central channel for DNA recognition. And we think that's really the structure that's actually searching through a genome. When it finds a matching DNA sequence, it forms an RNA-DNA helix in the protein that allows a further change in the protein's shape that may actually help it unwind the DNA strands. And then finally, there's a chemical cleaver in the enzyme, this yellow part of the enzyme that swings into position so it can actually cut the DNA. We understand now a lot of detail about how this protein actually operates. You can really see in a video like this that it's really a little molecular machine that is has been evolved over eons in microbes to have this very particular ability to recognize DNA at a one particular position and generate a double-stranded break. So it's great for bacteria, but it's also great as a technology. And so what's happening right now is that, you know, it just, it was sort of an incredible experience of going through this uh, 
um, you know, time in the lab where we were focused on the fundamental biology and mechanism of something like this, and then starting to watch it take off as a technology. And we were doing some work in that area too, even, you know, we were just, even though that's not sort of what we do as professionals, but we were so fascinated by the fact that this enzyme provides a capability that hadn't really been possible before for precisely altering uh, sequences in cell types and allowing scientists to do that in a way trivially, right? It was easy to do it. And so this technology has now advanced to the point where it's, it's really, uh, we're starting to see exciting applications in a wide range of areas, including in, of course, fundamental research, but also in healthcare, in therapeutics, in agriculture, and in diagnostics. And I thought I would just, in the last couple of minutes of the talk, I wanted to just highlight some of the things that are happening right now that are, I, I think, really interesting, but also lead us to some fundamental questions about the ethics of a technology like this that's powerful, simple to use, and presents opportunities, but also, I think, tremendous challenges to, to all of us as, as, as humans. And so I, um, just as, as one example of, of research that's going on that I think could have exciting implications in the future for, for uh, clinical medicine is something that we're actually working on with scientists at UC San Francisco. Berkeley doesn't have a medical school, so we have, but fortunately we've got a branch of our university right across the bay with uh, one of, the, most, uh, one of the, the best medical schools. So we've been able to work with colleagues there to start asking, how could you imagine using genome editing to eventually come up with an effective treatment or even a cure for neurodegenerative disease? And this is an example of experiments done by Brett Stahl in my lab. He was a Stanford graduate student who came to my lab as a postdoc with the idea that he could potentially come up with a way to introduce gene editing molecules like this Cas9 protein into the brain where it could affect changes in the DNA that would have a beneficial effect on patients with neurodegenerative uh, disease. And what he's doing here in this experiment is he makes a modified form of Cas9 that is able to penetrate across cell membranes. And so what he does is to take that modified protein, add the guide RNA, so he adds that little address label in the lab in just in a purified setting, and then we can inject it into the brain, and this we're doing this in a mouse model of a neurodegenerative disease known as Huntington's disease that has a well-known single uh, genetic defect that causes the disease. And we can inject this into the brain of these mice, and we're doing this in a mouse that has a, uh, an, uh, an engineered genome so that when editing occurs in the de desired place, the cells actually turn on a red protein, and you can actually see the cells uh, that turn red. So it's a very nice visual way to observe where editing is occurring. And you can see that in the experiment, the slice of a mouse brain on the right, we actually get significant amounts of editing on two sides of the brain where these proteins have been injected. So it just gives you a sense of the kind of specificity that we're talking about with something like this. And we're actually now moving towards uh, working with larger animal models and really thinking hard about how we could move this from an experiment in, in a research laboratory to a setting where you could imagine conducting a clinical trial someday. I also want to point out that there are other applications in healthcare that I think are really interesting, but in my opinion, also bring up ethical questions. And one of them is this uh, work that's being done both in academic and commercial labs now to engineer animals to be better organ donors for humans. And this is a um, picture of some piglets that were uh, generated by CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing that were, where the genome editor was used to do two things. One was to remove endogenous viral DNA sequences that are naturally integrated into the pig genome and could be problematic for humans if their organs were implanted, uh, transplanted. And the other thing is to use gene editing to create humanized versions of the pig genome that would allow the, their organs to be better accepted by a, a patient in a donor kind of setting. 
So this is going on. Companies want to make money from this. Doctors are interested, and of course, patients are potentially interested in this. Um, what about the pigs? And so we have to think about you know, animal, animal rights, animal welfare. This, you know, and, and this is just one example, but there, I don't know if anyone saw the story in Gizmodo recently, but there's also work going on in monkeys that also, I think, raises uh, questions about how we're using genome editing in animals and what would be the right way to regulate and control that kind of work. And then I just want to mention uh, that uh, um, there's just a lot of really, really exciting work that's being uh, happening right now in agriculture. And I just want to mention one example of this. And this um, is a picture from a publication from, I think, already two summers ago from a lab at Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Zach Lipman. And I was at a meeting a few months ago where Zach was giving a talk, presenting his, his more even uh, uh, more recent work, where he showed that he could use CRISPR-Cas9 in tomatoes to literally change a regulatory sequence in the tomato genome that allowed him to dial up or down the number of fruits that these plants were producing. And they were genetically the same otherwise, right? So it's really an incredible thing. I mean, it's a room this size, packed, and he was giving a talk, and most of the people in the audience were scientists working on you know, mammalian cells and thinking about biomedical applications. And Zach gave his talk, and there was a collective Oh, from the audience because, well, we all like tomatoes maybe, but um, you know, it was just an incredible demonstration of the power of a tool like this that allows you to have that kind of genetic control over an organism, something like, like uh, controlling the number of, of fruits that are produced. And then finally, I just want to mention that one of the, one of the uh, more recent areas of development using CRISPR uh, enzymes is actually the area of diagnostics, because some of the research that we and others have done shows that these enzymes are useful not only for cutting DNA, but also for holding on to DNA and triggering a signal that you can detect easily in a test tube. And this has brought about the idea that you could potentially use these systems not only to make uh, edits in, inside of cells, but you could also use it to detect DNA and RNA molecules that come from viruses, for example, or bacteria that you might want to detect in a clinical setting, but do it, do it in a very simple, cost-effective way, um, point-of-care uh, kind of uh, diagnostic, almost like you know, sort of imagine a home pregnancy test uh, kind of test that would allow you to figure out if you have a bacterial infection or a viral infection, you know, things like that. So that's also an area where there's now very rapid advances that are happening using these kinds of bacterial proteins. So it's triggered a whole sort of field of not only people like me that are understanding fundamental aspects of these proteins, but also a large commercial enterprise of people that are trying to capitalize on different aspects of these enzymes. And that, again, raises questions about you know, who owns CRISPR and who should own it and, and who should make money from it and how do we regulate it and all of those sorts of uh, questions that I never thought I would have to uh, think about, but now I do. And, uh, and I want to, want to just end by, uh, by mentioning that um, there, there are fundamentally two different ways that we could imagine using a genome editing tool like CRISPR to make changes to the DNA of cells. One is doing it in what we call somatic cells. These are fully differentiated cells where the changes that are made are not heritable by future generations. But the other kind of change is doing that kind of editing in what's called the germline. That means in sperm or eggs or embryos where the genetic changes become part of an entire organism and they can be inherited by future generations. And this uh, possibility was clear very early on because of the research done initially in zebrafish and then later in rats and mice and then ultimately in monkeys and then more recently uh, in, in humans. And this is a picture that just shows the way this is done. So this is actually a mouse uh, embryo, fertilized egg, that's being held by a pipette on the left, injected with CRISPR-Cas9 molecules with, by a needle coming in from the right. And these experiments are certainly in, uh, in mouse uh, embryos and other kinds of you know, fish and, and worms and those sorts of animals that are worked with in the laboratory, this kind of editing is trivial to do. And it turns out that it's also not that difficult to do it in, in mammals, in, in, in primates, and even in uh, humans. And so several years ago now, this was actually a, a picture that was on the cover of The Economist magazine 
under the banner Editing Humanity. And at the time, I think many of us working in the field felt that it was, you know, it was a little bit science fiction-y and it was a little bit um, you know, of hyperbole, right? Because you know, it was sort of imagining all the things you might do with genome editing. And for those of you that are, you know, know about human genetics, you know that you know, these uh, types of traits that are shown here are traits that, for the most part, we don't know the genetics of. And most likely, they have many genes that contribute to these traits. So, uh, it's not, it wouldn't be uh, um, something that one could imagine doing today. But nonetheless, it raised the specter of genome editing in, uh, in humans, and not only in somatic cells, but also in the human germline. And as you may know, uh, fast forwarding now a few years, we had a conference in November of, of uh, 2018, so just a couple of months ago, in Hong Kong, at which a scientist in China, in fact, announced that he had, in fact, done germline editing in human embryos, and not only for research purposes, but had actually implanted those embryos, and they were, those uh, babies had, in fact, been born. So this was um, really, I think, a wake-up call to the international community that we need to really get serious about thinking about how we talk about this, how we explain it to people, how we, um, how we imagine regulating it, and uh, what can be done to ensure that there is responsible use of what is a very exciting uh, technology, but that also has potential for um, you know, very ethically, um, I think, uh, challenging kinds of applications like, like the one that was announced in Hong Kong. And I'm going to leave it there because we're gonna, I know we have a lot of things uh, to discuss. Um, but uh, summarizing, I'm just pointing out that RNA-guided gene editing has become a very powerful tool, and many uh, researchers across the world are taking advantage of this technology now in their fundamental work, but increasingly we're going to see uh, products coming to market that are generated using this. And um, we have to think about controlling it. We have to think about regulation. And um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the biology is going to continue to drive uh, the technology, I think, as it goes forward. And uh, I want to just thank a fantastic group of people. This is a recent photograph of my research lab at Berkeley. Wonderful collaborators. I couldn't possibly list them all, but these are just sort of a collection of people that have, we've been working with uh, recently. And then, of course, we've had uh, wonderful uh, support for the work, and I couldn't have done this without trust by agencies that you know, believed in us when we were working on a you know, very obscure system called CRISPR that nobody had, had ever heard of. And I, finally, I just want to mention the Innovative Genomics Institute, a partnership between UCSF, Berkeley, and the Gladstone uh, Institutes. We actually have some faculty here at Stanford who are affiliates of the IGI, and we're doing a lot to both advance fundamental research with genome editing, but we also really want to be part of the discussion and conversation about education and, and ethics. And I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. you get started, Kelly. You know, I think you really ended on the keynote to me, which is how do we combine some of the exciting parts of this technology while trying to minimize the chance of things like the babies being born when we don't know enough. So the first thing I want to hear from you is almost a little more about your personal reaction to that news and what it must have been like to be at that Hong Kong summit when this was all coming down, if you don't mind sharing. Right. Well, I, uh, I had, a, I had a, a little heads up about it because I actually got an email from He Zhangkui, the scientist who, who made this announcement, a few days ahead of the, the conference in Hong Kong. And you can just imagine getting an email whose subject line was babies born. Babies born. I kid you not. And it explained in just a couple of sentences that this had been done very matter-of-factly and that he wanted to have a private meeting with me uh, before or during the meeting in Hong Kong where he was an invited uh, speaker. I, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a, a real shocker. And so I, I called uh, David Baltimore, who was the mm -hmm. chair of the organizing committee for that meeting, which I was serving on as well. And we agreed that, you know, we needed to really have a plan in place for how to 
manage this because we could just only imagine that it would be a, a big circus around this, <laughs> this kind of announcement. And uh, I immediately changed my flight. I flew out that night to Hong mm -hmm. Kong, and I got there in time to have some meetings with not only the organizing committee, but also with Ho Jiang Kui uh, twice. We met uh, before the conference actually started. Mm -hmm. And what struck me when I met with him was that, um, and you've, you know, you've seen maybe the pictures of him. He's, very, he's, a, he's quite a young uh, scientist. He actually did his postdoctoral training here at Stanford in the lab of Steve Quake. And uh, he's, not a, he's not an MD, he's not a clinician, he's not somebody that uh, does, you know, runs an in vitro fertilization clinic or something like that. And he also seemed, I thought, remarkably naive about what the likely public reaction would be to his work. I think he, he sort of had somehow imagined that he would be embraced uh, internationally, that people would uh, celebrate this as a, a great achievement and that perhaps he might even be awarded, you know, big prizes for his work. And, and I think he was quite, quite shocked, really, that, in fact, the reaction was, was quite the opposite. Yeah. If you had had the opportunity to talk with him like some of our colleagues have in advance, what would you have said to him if he gave you hints this was in the works? Well, you know, the thing was that he, he had actually appeared uh, a couple of times previously in my, you know, in my sort of professional travels. I had come across him at a couple of meetings. And in fact, he had been, he had attended a small, very small meeting that we had at Berkeley mm -hmm. that was ironically about ethics, <laughs> human germline editing. Um, and, uh, you know, he had presented some work, but it always appeared to me as though he was doing fundamental research. I had no idea that he was actually mm -hmm. intending to proceed to the clinic. And I think if he had made that known to me, certainly I would have... Uh, I would have uh, advised against it. <laughs> so I'm curious to ask, um, in, as the non-scientist amongst us here, and, and I'm sure there are some people in the room too, maybe many, who um, are aware of the general story, but when you get into the details of the science, can't follow along. So I just want to try out a couple of ideas that, in, in reaction to this announcement about the birth of babies that have been CRISPR edited, <laughs> to make sure I, I, I gather together the kind of big takeaway um, from it. So uh, this is a revolutionary technology because it provides this relatively simple approach to editing um, genes, not just human genes, but the, the genes of, en of any species. And uh, as I understand it, relatively low barrier to entry. Um, so say, you know, people um, have often talked about uh, analogies, say, to the Manhattan Project and, 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 and the nuclear bomb or the, the uh, nuclear physics, where you needed uranium, and it wasn't easy for anyone to get their hands on that. So it was easier, comparatively speaking, to regulate research into um, um, a nuclear energy. The barrier to entry here is pretty low. Maybe you can say, like, it's, it, if someone had a whole bunch of advanced classes in high school like Ji Wu has. Like, how much money do you need to set up a CRISPR editing lab in your, in your garage? I'm kind of curious to answer to that. Um, it's a lot less than doing something in nuclear physics, that's for sure. That's for sure. Uh, and you get to the germline, so it's not just editing um, the, the gene of a particular organism, but it now gets passed on all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the profound nature of this. Um, so, you know, the story about, you know, the, the kind of journalistic sensationalist way to put this would be playing God with the genetic sequence itself. Of course, it can have unbelievably important positive therapeutic uses, and you gave some examples of those, um, in, including with plants and not just animals and uh, um, the like. But I want to get to the potentially less um, um, beneficial uh, applications, but maybe just set the stage for you know, like, how easy is it to get access to the technology? And the background to that question, of course, is like as with artificial intelligence and information technology, where the people who develop it, let's assume, are extremely well-intended, imagine all types of beneficent uses of the technology, but when it gets out and circulated, they learn that there are people who are not as well-intended not so beneficent, and can use the same technology for really, I mean, the kind way to put it would be unhappy ends. But an unhappy end in the CRISPR case is germline editing that then goes through the progeny of all future organisms. That's a profound thing. So 
give, give us a little bit of the detail about what's the barrier to entry for a really sharp 14-year-old? <laughs> and the well-meaning scientific community um, that is imagining all of these powerful applications, uh, how does the well-meaning scientific community think about the lessons that, you know, in local terms, Facebook has learned about the malevolent uses of connecting people around the world. Yeah. Well, uh, with respect to access to this as a technology, for scientists, that, you know, func uh, operating scientists in, in academic labs, it's, it's very inexpensive to get a hold of, of the Cas9 protein and the kinds of you know, constructs that you would need to work with it in the lab. So, for example, there's an organization called AdGene, which is a nonprofit that's operated out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, that distributes research reagents to scientists at cost. So that means that for $65, you know, the essentially the cost of a FedEx you know, shipment, you can get a hold of the Cas9 protein and the, the uh, accompanying molecules that you would need to direct it into cells and start using it for, for genome editing. So that's one of the things that's actually made this technology so I would say democratizing, right? It's just become widely available. You don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to have special connections. You don't have to know somebody who knows somebody. You can just, you know, you can just get a hold of it. And then in terms of more sort of DIY, do-it-yourself uh, kind of science, well, um, you know, the, uh, Indiegogo, you know, my, my neighbor down the street uh, three or four years ago actually, you know, texted me one day and said, hey, Jennifer, did you see that Indiegogo is selling a CRISPR kit? I was stunned, and uh, actually they do, right? So uh, then some smart uh, scientists, some young uh, people just right out of um, college at the Innovative Genomics Institute tested it, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they've started working with some high school uh, teachers around the Bay Area who wanted to get access to this for their students, and they're now working on a kit that actually does work, that allows students not to edit embryos, but to edit yeast and turn them green and you know, things like that so the students can actually learn about how these molecules work and what they enable because we hope that part of the, you know, we think that part of the path forward with all of this is education. It has to be about teaching young people about this, what it is, how it works, and, and how to think about using it responsibly. All right, that, that, I'm going to pick up on that last phrase, using it responsibly. So... I don't want to in any way minimize these enormous potential beneficent therapeutic uses, and we should t definitely talk more about them. But using it responsibly, if, it ta if we're talking about a couple hundred bucks, you know, democratizing CRISPR experiments um, is one way to put it that sounds like, great, we get lots of people invested in the technology, get a bunch of experiments, we'll get quicker innovations. But if you were to go back to the Manhattan Project idea of like democratizing nuclear weaponry sounds nightmarish. So again, the, the philosopher in me wants to you know, make a realist take, uh, a take a realist you know, picture of human beings and intentions. And the professional community that at the moment at least with respect to Dr. Het in China is you know, roundly condemned the, the, the CRISPR edited baby if it's fully democratized at low cost in any corner of the world with the you know, relatively minimum amount of know-how given the low barrier to entry, why rely on the good intentions of people? Or, or better, should we rely on the good intentions of people? You mean, should we rely on good intentions versus putting in place some kind of legal framework or right. you know, something? Yeah, well, this is something that you know, many people are discussing this right now. And the challenge is that I think even if you wanted to put in place a legal framework, the reality is that right now, you know, with the way that uh, science and, and really our societies are global, whether yeah. we like it or we don't, it's, it's just a fact. And so if we here in the United States, for example, agreed that you know, this is just too dangerous of a technology, let's not allow scientists to use it, uh, there, you know, that would have its own issues of you know, debate and trying to figure out how you would enforce such a thing. But I think the reality is that this uh, kind of use and, and various uses of, of gene editing or any other technology like this would forge ahead in other countries. And so would the U.S. want to take a position of a back seat to that, or do we want to instead, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, be playing more of a leadership role? And, 
you know, that's, and again, there's no right or wrong answer to it necessarily, but I myself think that we're better off being, being engaged and, and trying to, if we can, uh, play more of a leadership role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. I'm in a basic science department, even though I am not a basic scientist, and, and one of the challenges that I see is as much as our scientist colleagues want to sort of think about these ethical issues and the good, um, you said something earlier that really struck me, which is you follow the science where it takes you, and you don't always know where that's going to be. Um, and I worry a little bit that, that in order for our scientists to really take advantage of that, they don't always get the training and the support to think about the ethics. So I wonder what thoughts you have on that, because I feel like you're, you've really come out strong about the ethics on this from the very beginning, and that is unusual frequently when we have these new technologies. I think you're right. My, my experience in science is that I think many scientists, and frankly I would put myself in the same category until very <laughs> recently, uh, was sort of having the opinion that I'm not a bioethicist, I'm mm -hmm. not professionally trained in that area, that's somebody else's responsibility, I'm just doing my next experiment, I'm trying to publish my paper, I'm trying to yeah. finish my thesis, you know, right? I'm trying to get a job, I'm trying to get tenure. And, um, and I think many scientists, uh, you know, feel that way, and I sympathize because I, under, I understand that, that mentality uh, completely. I do think that you're right, that we actually don't do a good job, at least in, in, in our graduate program, it's true, and in the tr programs that I came through as a trainee, in exposing students to um, you know, the, the realities of thinking about their work in the context of how it might be used, mm -hmm. uh, how it might impact other people, other fields, fields that they, don't, that they aren't expert in, and it's, it's a big challenge. I'm not sure how we, how we tackle that. Um, I'd love to hear, I don't know if you have you know, thoughts about that or ways that you envision you know, educating students that, you know, because we, you know, we, I think we all, you know, we all, like I'm, I'm teaching right now an ethic, I'm participating in an ethics course at Berkeley, you know, for our graduate students. But it's, it's really not about this kind of thing, right? It's really just about, uh, you know, who should be a co-author on a paper and, you know, things like <laughs> yeah. that, right? What, yeah. you know, uh -huh. right? It's that kind of thing. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I'm not trying to minimize that. It's important, but it's a different level from what we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm sure you have the yeah. same experience when you teach, but sometimes it does feel a little bit like being Sisyphus and always pushing it up the mountain. Um, but the challenge is to try to find ways to do that, I think, that don't make it seem like folks who work in bioethics are just like, no, you may not do this, right? I once had someone at our genetics department retreat say to me, um, do you like genetics? Because you're always talking about the bad parts of it. And I was like, no, I love genetics. That's the best part. So I'm sorry that sometimes bioethicists come across as, as being like the, the goalkeepers or the people who are supposed to stop something. And I want to find a way that we can work better together as a team to move science forward in an ethical way. Just quick thought on this too. I mean, the um, at one level, as the resident philosopher here on the stage, the person who thinks about ethics um, professionally, you know, more or less full time, there's a piece of me that reacts to hearing the story about what scientists are like, and, and even you, know, you, you said, until some of the more recent years and the recognition, recognition of the power of the technology. The scientists are also humans. Living mm -hmm. a human life involves confronting profoundly difficult, complex moral questions. I'm not sure why that would be walled off from one's professional life, so I just <laughs> always am curious about the division of labor in one's head between being a human and being a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> That's Fair. my own curiosity there. <laughs> um, but then separately, you know, since I now am in getting involved in this research effort here at Stanford called Human Centered, Art Centered Artificial Intelligence, and I'm teaching a class now on ethics, public policy, and technology. We're not really foregrounding any issues in biotechnology, but it is um, interesting to me to reflect on the fact that in medical schools, as a result of a whole variety of things that happen, some of them really not happy stories about experimenting on human beings in ways that now we recognize as profoundly wrong and unethical, um, bioethics has become a kind of institutionalized feature within education, and you can't, you know, you wouldn't find a medical school that didn't have a bioethics unit. You can't, to the best of my knowledge, become a doctor without taking classes in bioethics, and there are professional standards that um, are expected to be upheld, and there's nothing quite equivalent to that in a school of engineering with respect to computer scientists, and so that's an, an interesting um, um, story for me. But 
I'm aware when I you know, walk across campus to this, you know, the science quad here that there is a, you know, a kind of sensibility that the ethicist's role is the finger-wagging role. It's like the slow down, think about it some more, maybe not do it at all. And the reaction is often, just let scientists be scientists. Let us go full throttle on innovation and discovery because we want to remind you about the revolutionary stuff that often comes out of this. And of course, I'm not immune to that response, but um, if you feel like it's you know, pushing the Sisyphean boulder up the hill or you know, reacting in a way which the let scientists be scientists is the circle that um, you're familiar with, how then is the challenge for you of bringing these ethical and social dimensions of something as revolutionary, and I mean that in the fullest sense of the word, with positive and negative uses as, as CRISPR? Right. Well, I think that um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what how what your what your question is. Well, yeah. But... Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but that, but... that counted as a. Uh, sorry. That's, that's good. That's maybe my fault. Sorry. No, no. That, that's that's my it's fault. That was a, my. You got you got me up and running there. <laughs> so let me put it as a question. If we recognize the ethical and social dimensions of this technology, and you have assumed, as you, you've said very clearly, that you've taken a responsibility to break out of the mold of being merely a scientist, accelerating the discovery, how's it gone the past couple of years, you know, when you head to Hong Kong and you got the email message as we started? Do you feel like it's pushing a boulder up the hill, or do you feel like breaking into a public conversation is you know, we're making good progress there, and the public awareness of the challenges here is going the way you're hoping. I think there's been an interesting thing that, that well, I'll make a few points relevant to that. I think that, um, I mean, look at the room here tonight. I mean, this is really incredibly exciting to me to see all of you here. You're interested in the science, but I think you're also here because you're really interested in where this technology is going. Um, and you're, you want to be part of that conversation, right? So I think that's wonderful. That's really, really exciting. I don't think scientists' role is to um, counter the finger waggers, you know, right? Or, or, or say, uh, you know, uh, I know best because I'm a scientist. I'll tell you what we should do with this technology. But I do think scientists need to be engaged in the conversation, and often they aren't. And so I think that, you know, what I see as maybe one of the roles that I can play right now is, is to encourage more scientists to get engaged and, and to be part of the discussion. And I think they want to. I just think they don't know how to. You know? So I think there's a, a desire. It's just that there's a, often scientists are, you know, they, they, you know, I often hear this. Believe me, I often hear this from my colleagues who say, but I don't know enough about X and Y to, you know, I'm not an expert in that. I can't really speak to it because I don't really know. And I always say, well, but neither do I. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm out there talking about things I really don't know about. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to learn and I'm really trying to facilitate a broader conversation. Let me take one more pass. I'm just sort of trying to get you to come over on my territory here as the <laughs> philosopher. That's I'll obvious. I'll be back here in a minute. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a sense of personal responsibility um, that you or any scientist could take. There's a sense of professional responsibility, of, you know, the, the various professional societies that you belong to, this Hong Kong meeting. Um, you're making statements not just as an individual, but as a group of scientists. And the third you know, piece of that potential three-legged stool, it seems to me, is external regulation of some kind, whether it's from a government, whether it's from some type of supranational body. Um, do you see a role for... Uh, policy regulation or uh, a supranational body that's not just a professional group of scientists somehow taking stock of this and, and regulating it in a way? I do. I definitely do. Yeah. And I think the question is how, how to do that. Whenever you say regulation or rules or, or laws, that immediately to me brings to mind enforcement, right? How do you enforce it? And I think that's a big challenge. And, and right now, you know, that's being discussed very broadly in the scientific community. How do we how do we put in place, for example, whether you want to call them guidelines or regulations um, that would govern the use of, for example, genome editing in human embryos? How do we do that in a way where scientists will, or anyone that might try to do this, would, would respect it? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the, 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 what happened in Hong Kong was kind of, a, to me, a really important wake-up call that what had been done up until now wasn't enough. 
right? It wasn't enough because when I talked to Hu Jiankui, he said to me, I said to him, but you know, what about this report that was produced by the National Academies? And it had very clear criteria for um, you know, proceeding into the clinic with human germline editing. Did you, did you consider that? And he said, oh, but I followed that. Right? He said, I followed that. And I said, how can you, how can you claim that? And he, you know, in his mind, I think, he really had convinced himself that he had followed those criteria. So to me, that says, well, we need much clearer criteria, for <laughs> one thing. Mm -hmm. And we also need to have much broader buy-in. So I think uh, another you know, thing that we talked a little bit about at dinner, but you know, it, I think is something worth considering, is what role do uh, scholarly journals play? in this, in this uh, kind of debate or discussion because um, one of Ho Jiankui's clear goals, I think, was to publish a prominent paper in a very high profile journal that would attract a lot of international attention and frankly would provide a lot of, um, you know, sort of professional, you know, stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. and, and so should journals do that? I've also had people say to me, why hasn't he published his work? I would like to read what he did and be able to evaluate for myself what do I think of what he did, right? And so I think that's another uh, you know, factor in all of this. I mean, we, when we were in Hong Kong and Ho Jiang Kui you know, was a scheduled speaker there and he was uh, planning to get up and you know, give, give his talk, we were sitting in the audience and waiting for him to come on stage and there was a lot of security and there's tons of media and it was really, really a circus. And uh, meanwhile, and I was sitting next to someone who was getting uh, real-time you know, texting from someone in the US who said, did you know that Scott Gottlieb at the FDA, who's the head of the FDA, has just posted an interview where he is very critical that you hmm. folks at the National Academies at this meeting in Hong Kong are giving a stage to Ho Jiankui. Why are you giving him an opportunity to present his work? He should be hmm. condemned. And we literally had to kind of in real time respond to that, to Scott Gottlieb, and, and explain that in our view, this person is, you know, whether you like it or not, he is someone who is part of the scientific community. He has done something, he's claimed something, and he's already a scheduled speaker at a meeting. He should get up and present his data for evaluation by a group of scientists. That's how we viewed it. So, you know, people have different opinions, but that was how we, we, we viewed it. Hmm. But then you could, you know, you could take a different point of view potentially about, mm -hmm. you know, should he be allowed to publish that work in a scholarly journal? And believe me, I've heard opinions all over the map about that. Mm -hmm. Well, so I want to ask one last question before I know we need to get to some yeah. audience questions. Yes. You must all have a million. Um, we could talk for hours about safety and whether or not this is ready for prime time or if it ever should be. But if we can jump forward however many decades or years to imagine that day, I want to hear from you about how we decide what medical conditions, um, and we'll stay away from enhancement for now. You can all ask about that in a minute. Um, what medical conditions are the right ones, either for somatic germline treatment or germline? And, and you gave the example of Huntington's disease, which I think anyone who works in medicine knows is a quite medically severe, really profound condition. And that's probably one of the more clear-cut examples. But there are many more illnesses and disabilities that are going to be less clear. So what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, um, I think that, you know, in my opinion, we would certainly want to start with diseases like that, that have a clear single genetic cause that's mm -hmm. well known and well documented, where there are studies that have been done that, you know, have looked, for example, at animal models and mm -hmm. followed the behavior of animals that where you've been able to, you know, alter that, uh, the gene that's involved and test for safety. And, um, and then I think you, know, you also have to think about the practicalities of doing this. For example, right now, in my opinion, uh, probably the major bottleneck to moving forward in the clinic, just, you know, just scientifically, not, not ethically, is delivery. You know, how do we actually introduce gene editing molecules into the cells where you want to make changes to DNA and not into other cells. Mm -hmm. And that's still something that's very hard to do, not just with CRISPR, but with you know, lots of other things too. But um, you know, the technology, again, it's, you know, it's moving forward very quickly. So I think what we're going to see is uh, kind of a, you know, an evolution of thinking about you know, the kinds of diseases that can be treated 
now, and right now, you know, the easiest ones are going to be things where you could take, for example, blood cells out of a patient, do the editing outside the body, and then put the cells back so mm -hmm. they can repopulate the, the blood supply with corrected cells to correct things like sickle cell disease. Um, versus something like Huntington's, where, as I mentioned, you know, the big challenge there is how do you get it into neurons and ensure that the kind of editing that occurs is uh, safe and, and effective at, at treating the disease. And I think we're a lot farther away from being able to do that right now. So part of it, I think, will just be decided based on the, you know, where the technology is. Yeah. How much of it do you think is going to be the scientists picking the diseases either that are kind of technically easier to treat versus really looking to the families and the patients with these conditions and finding out who really wants these therapies that to go forward? That is such a good question. That is a great question. And I think about that a lot because I think right now, and again, this is my, just my view of it, I think that um, uh, right now a lot of it is being driven by, frankly, just by scientists deciding mm -hmm. that this is possible to do, that is not so possible to do, mm -hmm. uh, or at least you know, I, not possible for me to do. And so you know, choices are being made based on those mm -hmm. kinds of, of factors rather than what's the most pressing medical need, yeah. right? And the other thing is that, and I see this, and I, I suspect that my colleagues in, in working in, in the field see it as well, is that you know, I get approached quite often by family foundations mm -hmm. or even wealthy individuals who say to me, I would like to sponsor research on you know, you know, disease X, uh, which is typically you know, a, a rare disease that affects their family, and um, you know, some, some of them are willing to put in a lot of money. And so then you have to decide, you know, is that, is that, what are the ethics of that? Like, is that? Should that drive our decisions? Should we be working on rare diseases that are sponsored by billionaires, you know, and, and, but not working on things that might affect many more people? Uh, you know, it's a, I think these are really, there, there's a lot of ethical questions there as well. We're going to open it up to questions, but I want to end. We've got um, microphones on either side. So if you have a question, you can line up now. As we get to questions, I'll just end with where Kelly prompted us, which is this, this distinction that often gets made between um, uh, genetic enhancements and, and therapeutic uses, uses. Oh, yeah. Do you think that's the right distinction, where the therapeutic stuff is the beneficent good part and the enhancement part is the ethically worrisome part? Uh, or is there a, a better <laughs> distinction to make? How do you think about that conventional distinction in the first place? I think it's actually a hard distinction to make, actually, um, except in sort of the, at the extremes. Because, for example, there's a well-known gene that affects um, hyper cholesterolemia, right, which is, you know, one of the leading causes of cardiovascular disease in, you know, in, in humans. And so if, if it, suppose it became possible to um, knock out that gene in, let's say, in embryos so that you would effectively protect people for over their lifetime against heart attacks and strokes. They don't have to worry about their diet. They don't have to take drugs. They just don't have to worry about that, right? They might have to worry about other things, but not that. You know, is that an enhancement? Or is that, uh, you know, is that a medically yeah. important thing to do? I, it's hard to know how you would quite define that. But I think we might not be that far from having those kinds of decisions to make. Yeah. All right, let's open up the questions. If you could avoid doing the rambling non-question that I succumbed to, that would be great. <laughs> we'll start over here, sir. First, I want to thank you for this uh, enlightening, educational, and thought-provoking forum. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I have a question. You, you started to go down a path where you were talking a little bit about the future. I want to pull on that thread a little bit more because I frankly feel that we are human 1.0 in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, you have brought on through these technologies uh, what I think will become human 2.0. And I think we are the transitional generations that are the folks that are sitting in this room. But maybe 100 years from now, the transition will be over. And the 2.0 will, will supersede. And I haven't heard anyone really talk about what are the ethics and how should society, how should we as a, uh, you know, the, the last of our kind, handle this transition because I think that is really what's at play and I think that's the horror of when you talk about the incident in Hong Kong is that we start to see that this is the thin wedge that will only grow uh, as this century unfolds and I think that's really the reality of what's going to happen because you can't stop human nature 
if your child has a disease like you talked about, you're going to do everything in your power yeah. and everything your wallet can afford to fix that. And if you don't do it here at Berkeley, then they will go and find another lab somewhere else in some other country and get it done. And as the technology becomes more precise and more effective, then it will move on from curing diseases to why wouldn't you? Look what parents do today to, to give their child every possible advantage to get into a school like this or get a job at an at a outstanding company or whatever. So this will just be another tool in that toolbox. So I, I think the reality is the human 2.0 is going to happen. And what I Time. really want us to talk about is <laughs> um, how, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with it and, and make that transition? Right. Well, I, that's, that's a, a great you know, point and a great question. And I think, I think that um, you know, the sh short answer, I guess, is that we need, we need certainly to have forums like this where we discuss these issues so that people become aware of just what's happening. I agree with you 100% that I think we're all living through a fascinating moment right now, if you will. Um, Hank, Hank Greeley, who's in the audience, has written a bit about this, where you know, the whole way we think about, for example, human reproduction, I think, is changing. I had that profound sense when I was in Hong Kong, actually, sitting there and listening to this guy's presentation. You know, I, just, I thought, oh my god, you know, I'm like living through this you know, historical moment. But I think you're right, that in the future, it's, 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 gonna, you know, it, it's coming. I think we can all see that. And the question is not, should this happen because I don't think we can prevent it, but it's how will it happen, and that's important. And I, you know, that's what we need to work on is the how part. The, the questioner described it not as a fascinating moment, but we are the transitional generation. Um, yeah. um, interesting way of putting it. We'll go up to the top and then come over here. Yes, Professor Duna, thanks for being here. The uh, I've heard the word ethics and ex the word ethics has been thrown around, around about twelve times and. The regulation has been thrown around about 14 times, and it's not very clear to me anything concrete came out of that, that. So let me give you a concrete situation. What if North Korea right now, since Cas9 is so easily acquirable, CRISPR is so easily to be implemented, what if North Korea starts making babies out of this technique, designer babies? Do we treat this the same way as we do them testing nuclear weapons? And then how, in which case, how do we respond? So that's a concrete situation. Next month, the New York Times will publish an article, let us say 10,000 babies are, in, are being in the test bed in North Korea. What do we do? Uh, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is These are the real... geopolitical questions right. about science that are, are <laughs> profound. I I'm giving you an yeah. actual scenario, right? Well, we got the scenario. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we understand the scenario. Yeah. You know, but I think I think you you know you raise a, a good point that you know there there are things that can now be imagined at least that you know are not 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 that far out of what's possible, and so we have to start thinking together about how to you know how to deal with that. There in my view, no easy answer to, to that question, right? I don't, I don't, I don't know what, what the right um, response is right now to that. And um, I think that, you know, we all have to be, um, you know, a, as best we can engaging in this and, and working with our, our regulatory agencies, at least here in the U.S., but I really think it has to be an international effort to put in place uh, you know, a set of a set of I would call it regulations that you know that control that. But would would rogue states uh, follow those? You know, probably not. So I, it's it's a very hard question. And frankly, it's not just it does not just pertain to CRISPR Cas9, does it? I mean, it pertains to frankly any uh, technology that can be you know used for ill intent. Yeah, people speak of an arms race in AI. Maybe there's an arms race in CRISPR right. or in mm -hmm. enhancing humans. Right. Yes. So much. Thank you very much for this great talk today. Um, my name is Megan Palmer. I'm a bioengineer and now a policy scholar here at, um, at Stanford and also work to run part of an international competition in genetic engineering with a lot of these young scientists and engineers. And so my question really has to do with you know, thinking about this inspiration and engagement to work proactively on these issues. Um, and what's deep enough? You know, what's enough for some of these scientists and engineers? Because in this case, you know, we saw engagement with, 
with ethics. We saw even a, a set of ethical principles, right, being, being put out um, that almost served at a, a surface level as justification, right, instead of critique. And so, you know, how do you begin to think about that sort of surface level ethics engagement, sort of performance instead of practice? And related to that on some of these security considerations, should we think about engaging on those intentional misuse worst case scenarios in the same way? Well, to your first question, um, I've thought about this quite a bit, and, um, and I've had some really interesting debates about it. I think right now, my own opinion is that we're better off, you know, in the, let's just take human germline editing as an example. I think we're better off putting in place sort of detailed criteria that, you know, the international community agrees would need to be met for anyone to proceed into the clinic. Because I think what, what I sort of took away from you know, what happened in Hong Kong with this announcement was that you know, the, the, uh, the sort of the guidelines that were in place were too squishy. You know, it was easy for someone to convince themselves that they were actually following those guidelines. And so I think we actually need to have very precise criteria for what would need to be done to you know, proceed into the clinic again. And I think that that has to begin with an international forum of experts, but I think that hopefully would then lead to actual governmental level you know, regulations that would be put in place. And then your second point was? Uh, does this differ with some of the really intentional misuse, worst case scenarios? What do you think about you know, seeding that type of inspiration and, and information amongst, amongst this group? Right, well, I, you know, I, I, and again, this is just me speaking personally, right? So, you know, and I, I'm very interested to hear other people's opinion about this, but I, I often feel very uncomfortable when, you know, there's lots of, you know, effort to, if there's an effort to do kind of a detailed discussion of, uh, you know, unethical um, applications and how one would do that. And, you know, I, I think maybe that's appropriate for discussion at, you know, the meetings of the CIA or whatever, you know, the, the planning for these sorts of things. But I just think that doing that publicly or like publishing papers about how to do that is, is counterproductive myself. That's, that's my opinion. Yes, sir. Hi. So I want to frame my question around this hypothetical conversation that you might have with a young scientist somewhere in the world that might have come across a technology as powerful as CRISPR, maybe in another area. What words of advice or what words of comfort or what uh, technical kind of uh, uh, advice would you give to this young scientist if you were having a conversation with him or her? Well, I would say that it's important always to be thinking about the broader context of your work and how it could be used or misused. And, um, and, and just, you know, sort of the, just generally kind of the broader impact of work that, you know, any of us are doing, whether we're working on technologies or, or, or fundamental knowledge. And, and so that's one thing. And then, and then I think I would also say that um, I would advise not being afraid to trust your judgment and uh, don't, don't worry about not being an expert in um, bioethics or, or law. Um, because I think that, you know, scientists have to be willing to, you know, voice opinions and, and debate and discuss and, you know, learn from other colleagues who know more in those areas. And frankly, I think it's, uh, you know, for me personally, it's been a fascinating journey. I mean, I've learned more in the last six years than I probably learned, you know, in my entire life before that. So, Back up to the top. Uh, hello, up here. Oh, yeah. I uh, wanted to say thank you for coming out and also commend your courage for doing this because um, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Uh, I think Professor Reich asked some really good questions about what happens when people make weapons, basically. And this is tremendous weapons technology. Uh, so, you know, you're the founder of four companies. You're going to be a billionaire, I think it's safe to say. Uh, my med school <laughs> classmate is working with you at Intellia, the CEO. He's a very smart guy. You guys will be successful. And you'll be able to get your constructs into cells. And then if that gets married up with something that does it widely, um, I think you've got an ethical problem because you've built a capacity, let's say, at Intellia, where you can do this, but you haven't developed an antidote. You haven't developed a vaccine. 
So if you're going to release something into the wild that can get into cells and change people's genomes, don't you have a responsibility also to prevent that from being weaponized and to work just as hard on the counter, <clears throat> excuse me, counter technology as on the uh, offensive technology? Agreed. And I'm glad you brought that up because actually that exactly what you just said, sort of an antidote to CRISPR or an anti-CRISPR is something that has caught the attention of agencies, including the Department of Defense. And they have a, an organization called DARPA, and DARPA has put out, uh, I think now it's at least two calls for proposals that are aimed at exactly what you just said, basically controlling CRISPR, making sure that it's done safely, and not only that, that you could uh, shut it down if you needed to, or even reverse its effects if you needed to. But and yeah, yeah. But you want to outsource it to the government? Isn't it the responsibility of the companies to do this? Um, well, first and, of all, mm -hmm. well, I would just say if I were king of the FDA, I wouldn't let anything on the market unless it had an antidote already in its pocket. Well, so. Uh, the question is, how do you want that research to be done? So, you know, the government funds, you know, people like me, you know, academic scientists to do research, and they can direct that research by putting out calls for proposals in certain areas, as the DARPA agency did in this, in this case. And um, so, you know, frankly, that's one of the major ways that fundamental research gets done in, in the country. Companies, as you know, are, you know, they're uh, companies like Intellia, these are publicly traded companies. They have shareholders, they have fiduciary responsibilities to, they actually have to focus on getting products to market. Now, you could argue that, well, you know, part of the product has to be the, you know, the safety switch exactly. for it, um, but, you know, they might not agree. And so it just, you know, it just depends on, on what their priorities are. If the FDA were to say, we won't approve a therapy unless it has a safety switch, you can imagine they would prioritize it then, but that hasn't happened yet. So. I'll write my congressman. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gone a little bit over. We started a little bit late. Um, with apologies to the many people who still have questions, we're going to end with this question, and hopefully this will be the start of many such conversations here at Stanford. Thank you. Um, I had several deja vus in your discussion of, of the Asilomar conference and what was happening at that time, and I was wondering whether you um, I have studied any of the transcripts. I assume you've talked to Paul, and I'm sure David has a lot of insights into it. But there's so many things you were saying that were, seemed like exact conversations that I remembered at that time. Right. So he's referring to the Asilomar uh, meeting that happened back in 1975, which is a meeting that, you know, kind of historic because it was convened by scientists to discuss uh, something called molecular cloning. And this was at a time when it be had become possible to make pieces of DNA in the laboratory that encoded uh, particular kinds of proteins. You could clone them. You could make copies of them in bacteria. And it quickly became obvious to scientists doing this work that, uh, that first of all, this was very powerful technology. It was the origin of Genentech and, and arguably kind of the origin of kind of the whole sort of modern uh, biotech industry and modern molecular biology. But at the same time, it also was, you know, potentially very dangerous because, of course, in our in the human gut, we have bacteria of the type that are grown in the lab and that people were using for this kind of molecular cloning. And people started thinking, "Gosh, I mean, what if you had, you know, human gut bacteria that were suddenly, uh, you know, able to make, uh, you know, uh, anthrax or you know, some any any kind of um, uh, dangerous protein that." Could, that scientists could clone in the lab. And so they convened a meeting to discuss this. And um, as you mentioned, both Paul Berg and David Baltimore were part of that. And so that led to sort of a, a situation where there was initially kind of self-regulation by the, the scientific community. And it was, you know, if you look at how things unfolded, it wasn't entirely effective. But I think it did provide a model for how we can think about dealing with uh, other technologies like, like, for example, CRISPR. And so at the Innovative Genomics Institute back in 2015, we actually convened the first meeting of scientists to have sort of a, an Asilomar moment, if you will, and discuss the future of genome editing, especially in, in, in humans and in the human germline. And that meeting included both Paul Berg and uh, David Baltimore. 
and they were incredibly helpful, and they have been all along. Uh, as I mentioned, David Baltimore actually convened the meeting in, in Hong Kong that we just had. They, they've both been very involved and engaged in this conversation, and they provided important um, perspective because they've seen this, these, some of the same questions right, that ha were raised back in the 70s are now coming up again 40 years later about a new technology, but it raises some of the same kinds of issues. And I, I would argue actually then goes a step beyond, because now we're actually talking about uh, you know, not engineering bacteria, but we're talking about actually engineering humans, potentially. But it's a, it's a, it's a great, um, you know, it's been a, a great sort of blueprint, I would say, for, for shaping the conversation now. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Would you please join me in thanking Dr. Jennifer Doudna? <laughs>